Ladies and gentlemen, dear students, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the fourth 25th anniversary lecture. As you know, this year we celebrate 25th anniversary of the of, uh, Riga Graduate School of Law. And uh, I've got a special pleasure to introduce it to you, Professor Martin Krigier <laughs> from the University of New South Wales. And actually, the full, the full uh, title he got is that Martin is a Gordon Samuel Professor of Law and Social Theory at the University of New South Wales, and not only, because he is also Senior Research Fellow in Central European University, Democracy Institute, Rule of Law Program. And uh, Martin is a leading authority, or global leading authority, on rule of law. Scholar, <coughs> public intellectual, recognized globally, he published extensively on plenty of different topics, such as uh, law as tradition, civil society, very well known monography, mon <coughs> monography on uh, uh, Philip Selznick, and on constitutional populism, and of course on his favorite topic, which means rule of law. And he lectured also around the globe, from Sydney to Warsaw, and from Wagga Wagga, if you don't know where it, where is it to Berkeley. And <coughs> He's, how to say, he's an old friend of mine. I suffered with, with him 35 years almost in the same law school. The suffering is mutual. Recently in the same, sharing the same office as well. But I want to say that he's, a, as the old saying is, is telling us, ex oriente lux. What does that mean? It means light from Orient, from the East. Martin is coming from Australia, right? And uh, why is this, this, uh, light, because Martin perfectly person personifies this saying, it seems to me. He's from the east, southeast precisely, and is not only knowledgeable, but is also very wise. There's a plenty of scholars who are knowledgeable, but only few of them I could <coughs> include to this wise person. And my, Martin is one of them. So the topic of his, his, his talk, his lecture, you've got here, well temperate power, a cultural achievement of universal significance. Now the order. Martin will speak for about 40, 45 minutes, right? And after that, we'll have a time for the Q&A, questions and answers, comments as well. So Martin, welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Adam, and thank you all for being here. It had to be compulsory, I imagine, because this is a very nice crowd. Um, Adam is right. He tells the truth in saying we're very old friends. That has not been an easy, easy business. We disagree on everything. But somehow, like twins, uh, we can't separate uh, ourselves from each other. And so that's one reason I'm very pleased to be here in Riga. Another is that I gave a lecture, uh, a Zooming lecture, some time ago. And after the lecture, had a really engaging interview with two of your students. I don't know if either of them is here, I guess not. But that also focused me on this part of the world. And a third reason is that two of my intellectual heroes, in fact, one intellectual hero and one intellectual heroine, were born here. One just around the corner, and I've knelt at his plaque, Sir Isaiah Berlin, famous from Oxford, but born and spent his first years in Riga, one of the great names in the history of English, as it turned out then, uh, liberal thought in the 20th century. And I have yet to find a plaque in her name. Judith Schkla, who was professor of government at Harvard University, was also born in Riga. I've uh, been devoted to their writings for a very long time, so I'm at last, they're neither of them with us, but I'm at least in the town where they came from, and I'm pleased about that. Please, for many other reasons. Uh, let me begin with, with the title. I don't I know no, uh, Latvian, but I in particular don't know if Latvian has anything like tempering as a word or well-tempered. Tempering is a word that's found in a lot of European languages because it goes back to Latin, but if it's not a Latvian word, I'm going to have to do some... Uh, impromptu explanation as I go along, which is all right. But it's not a word you know. Oh, it depends. We have it in the sense of uh, tempering steel. 
Yeah, that's exactly the, one of the senses. But is it the word, same word? Okay. Well, we'll come back to the word. Let me start. Starting with uh, a book that appeared in 1975, which is a very long time ago. I was about as young as you are. And it was written by a very celebrated English Marxist historian, E.P. Thompson, Marxist, ex-communist, peace activist, very, very famous man with a lot of followers. The book he wrote, or the book was published, as Whigs and Hunters. Whigs and Hunters, The Origins of the Black Act. He was a, it was a book about legislation in the 18th century which made hunting in aristocrats and royal lands a capital offence. You get hanged for it. The Whig... That wasn't emotion. It was just bad ge geography. The Whigs were the ruling oligarchy in England. The hunters were these people who went into lands to look for game, pe pheasant, pheasants looking for pheasants, uh, for other sorts of game. The Black Act was called Black because when they went hunting, they used to black their face. And the act made, and the various allied acts, made hunt, this hunting, which they had been doing for centuries, capital offences, offences punishable by death. The book is 259 to 69 pages. The first 258 pages are, fair, are they're, they're wonderful read. He's a wonderful writer. But they're standard Marxist analysis. You've got a ruling class. They're exploiting the ruled. And this is the way that they're doing it. No surprises there. If Marxism was what you read, and I don't know how many of the younger people here actually do know much about Marxism, so I'm just going to have to bow to simplify it terribly much. One simple core belief among Marxists is that modern societies, capitalist societies, are divided on a f key feature, who owns the, m the means of production. The rulers are the ones who own the means of production. The ruled are the ones who are exploited by the rulers. This is horribly simplified, but it's enough to know 258 pages of this book were telling that story about the 18th century. But then there is a little heading in small print in italics, The Rule of Law, it takes up the last 12 pages of the book. And in it, Thompson said things of this sort about the rule of law. You see, he, sees that it's, he says it's a cultural achievement of universal significance, a phrase that I've borrowed. He says that it is an unqualified human good. Now, if you think for Marxists, there was nothing more outrageous than for a Marxist to say things like this. Because in capitalist societies, Marxists knew law was a tool of the ruling class not something that you could say anything good about. And after the revolution, there would be no law. Of course, I'm simplifying terribly complicated story, but it's enough just to understand why these pages in which these quotations appeared were so shocking. Here's Thompson, great man of English Marxism. He was one of the very great men of English Marxism in the middle of the 20th century, and he's saying stuff like this. And it outraged his erstwhile followers, the people who believed what he, they thought he believed. They were drummed, they, several of them, there are published articles saying he is no longer a Marxist. And that's not a nice thing to say if you're a member of the tribe. That means you're out of here. He was attacked and attacked for these pages. In fact, I don't know anyone who's read the other pages. There are 258 pages of a good book. No one's read them. But everybody read them. And this time, when this was notorious, they read these 12 pages. Now, I'm going to focus on the claim that the rule of law is a cultural achievement of universal significance. I think each of those words is significant, maybe more significant to me than they were to Thompson, because he also says it's an unqualified human good. I don't believe there are any unqualified human goods. So I'm not going to go there with him. I'm just going to stay and say I think Thompson is pointing to something deeply important and significant when he said that the rule of law is a cultural achievement of universal significance. 
Okay, so let's unpack that. First of all, the rule of law. Now, I don't know whether the rule of law is part of what you get taught, but the general way that people talk about the rule of law... So, let me preface that. No one was talking, except lawyers, about the rule of law till about 1990. That lawyers talked about it, but for other people it was not a very exciting topic. Then, for reasons we can go into in Q&A, after the collapse of European communism and of Russia, rule of law became the talk of the town. In fact, it became the talk of the globe. Billions of dollars have been put into rule of law programs, doing this and that, trying to bring the rule of law with great success, as you can see, to Myanmar, Afghanistan and various other places. Uh, this is not the atmosphere he was writing in. He was writing at a time when there weren't these universal rule of law programs. But both then and now, the conventional way to think about the rule of law is to say, well, there are certain necessary features of legal systems. Maybe the rules have to take a certain form. They've got to be clear. They've got to be prospective so they don't take you by surprise. They can't be contradictory so you don't know whether you're going this way or that way. They have to be uh, applied in ways in keeping with their terms. There are these lists. One legal philosopher after another makes lists of what the rule of law is. They're all about the aspects of legal forms. Or if you get into legal, pro legal promotion, if you go to Afghanistan or Myanmar as Adam and I did several years with spectacular lack of success promoting the rule of law, then you have these checklists of various institutions, institutional features. You teach courts how to run cases, and teach judges how to run cases and so on. You focus on the institutions. Now, Thompson does none of that. In fact, he says of the institutions he's talking about, where he believes the rule of law existed in England in the 18th century, that these were bad laws written by bad legislators enforced by bad judges. He had nothing much to say about the institutions. And I want to emphasize that point. In the large, huge literature on the rule of law, they talk about thin theories of the rule of law and thick theories of the rule of law. Thin theories say the rule of law is this institution, that institution, this sort of rule, that sort of rule. The thick theories say, no, that's not enough. You have to have some moral content. You have to have something about human rights, about justice, about equality. I think that's a bogus uh, distinction, uninteresting. Worse than that, I think it's one of, I've got a technical term about distinctions you find in rule of law literature. I call them bullshit distinctions. This is one, this is bullshit distinction number one, thin versus thick. Why? Because when you go bringing the rule of law to Myanmar, your, your thought of what institutions count are never very thin. They're the things you know at home. That's what you take. They're already encrusted with the particular ways you do things in your country or your legal tradition. And they're too thin as well. They're not thin enough because they have a lot of local stuff in them, but they're also too thin because, as we see in Hungary and Poland and many other places with modern populist regimes, and I'll be coming back to that later in the talk, you can do lots and still seem to be acting kosher in terms of the forms. You, keep, you can do it, you can do terrible things, as had been done in Poland and Hungary and many other countries, in, in uh, Venezuela, in Brazil, in the Philippines, in India, still by trying to hold on to the legal institutional forms. So they're not thin enough and they're too thin. And thick accounts, the ones which say, that's not enough. It's not, is this going too fast, by the way? Either linguistically or conceptually. Are you able to keep up with it? <laughs> this is the test. If he can, we all can. So that uh, the thick ones too often are just... They say you don't have the rule of law unless you have justice, equality, uh, fairness, human rights. But we've got terms for those things. We've got justice, equality, fairness, and human rights. We don't need another term. If you want to think about the rule of law as something distinctive, you've got to find out what's distinctive about it. Now look where, uh, where Thompson looks. He doesn't talk about the institution. He talks about a specific achievement 
It is the reduction of arbitrary power that is the achievement. And that's, that's not thin. I mean, that's a real achievement. But it's not everything. It is a specific thing. It's the reduction of arbitrary power. That is the job of the rule of law. Other things have other jobs, but that is the job, he says, of the rule of law. Now, as I've said, he was attacked by his fellow Marxists everywhere for this. This is a long time ago. Now, I was about the only guy I knew at the time who agreed with him or thought that he was on the money. Uh, and now nobody reads him. Uh, but he gets echoes. But the echoes no longer come from the Marxist left, they come from the populist right. And so, uh, this first passage describes ways in which Hungarians, in response to, or in reaction to European efforts, describe the rule of law. And it's not only in Hungary. Kaczynski, well, the first quote is not from Kaczynski, but from the speaker, late speaker of the House of Parliament in, in the same in Warsaw, says, law which does not serve the nation is lawlessness. And Kaczynski himself, Kaczynski, who was the real ruler of Poland, says when he, there was judicial resistance to unconstitutional measures against the constitutional court, he said, we're, not going to, we're going to settle this matter. We will not permit anarchy in Poland, even if it's promoted by the courts. Now, that signifies an attitude very different from Thompson's. That signifies an attitude which puts no store in reduction of arbitrary power. On the contrary, as, uh, Adam and I may argue about this, but my claim is that the reduction of their power is the last thing they want, and the allowing of arbitrary power to the rulers in many countries now in the world is what they want. So the debate has, in a sense, reappeared, but the people who were saying what the Marxists were saying against Thompson are now coming from the other side. The right in Europe, in India, in uh, Brazil, it was the left in, in Venezuela, uh, are saying things that have no time, no respect for the subjection of arbitrary power to uh, the rule of law. But that's not what they say, because, and this is a distinctive feature of modern populist rulers in the countries I've mentioned, Unlike Lenin, for example, who said the, uh, proletarian, the dictatorship of the proletariat is force unrestrained by any laws, that's not maybe what Putin says now, but it's not even what Putin said a few years ago, and it's not what these rulers say. They claim they are respecting the rule of law, but in their own distinctive national ways. The Europe, neither Europe nor anyone else should criticise them, still less try to withhold funds from them for not uh, abiding by the rule of law. They say the rule of law is something that is part of our national constitutional identity. You can't tell us what to do, we tell you how we do it. But we do it, that's the claim. And if the rule of law were what most people think it is, particular forms, particular rules, particular institutions, it's hard to see how you argue with them because they have those forms, they have those institutions. They pretend, often by cheating, more cheating in Poland than, than in Hungary because in Hungary they have a constitutional majority. They can do what they like, they've got two-thirds majority in Parliament. The Poles don't have that so they have to cheat more. But this, the aim of the game is similar. So they say, well, what's wrong with us? We do all these forms. We have a court, it's a bit different from your court. We have a constitutional court, it's got all the people are there. They've all been appointed. They do what they do. Actually, they do what they're told to do. But that is not what appears in the forms. So the issue that I want to come up with is, how do we respond to claims by people who, in my view, and I'm happy to argue it, are violating the ideal of the rule of law? How do we respond to them? when they seem and they say they're acting according to the rule of law. And here, I think, uh, Thompson is an enormous source for me of inspiration and of help. I might be cheating myself, that is. I might be reading 
my thoughts into him. But anyway, he's dead. So he can't complain. And if I am, I am using his words. So I mean, they, they are there. But I'm certainly not using them for purposes that he thought of. One last thing. Because the conventional understanding of the rule of law is bits and pieces, legislation, forms of laws, institutions. And because what he's talking about is something very different, it's the specific achievement of reduction of arbitrary power, however you get it, he's not specifying how it should be done. I think, and that's why my title is different from his, I'm not saying the rule of law is enough. I'm saying tempering power. Since we have some problems with the term tempering, for the time being, until I get later into the talk, let's say taming power, reducing arbitrariness in the exercise of power, is a cultural achievement of universal significance. So let's go to the words. What is, does it mean to say it's a cultural achievement? After all, it's a legal achievement. You're talking about the law. He knows that. But he says it's a cultural achievement. Is there something in those words worth thinking about? I think there are. What does he mean by it? Well, through these pages, he moves. He's not a philosopher. He doesn't say A leads to B leads to C. He's a sort of literary guy. He says a bit of this, a bit of that. It's all beautiful, but you've got to tease it out. So the first thing he says is, what, so what I'm asking now is, what would it mean to say the rule of law, as he says it, or tempering power, as I say, it, is a cultural achievement? Well, he says, there are these forms of law. Law has ways of packing, of... You've, you're learning here to think like lawyers. Maybe you already do think like lawyers. There's a particular way of thinking. Through certain forms, certain things seem right, certain things seem wrong, as you learn the forms of law. And that's what he says first. It's inherent in the special character of law as a body of rules, etc., that it shall apply logical criteria. Well, maybe that's so, but how many people care about that? That leads to the second cultural element of it. There are, in many legal systems, people like you who are trained and learn, they become lawyers. They don't just pick it off the shelf and throw it back on the shelf. They start to think like lawyers. They take seriously legal distinctions, legal ways of operating. And that's what he says here. There are enough people, there may be, there don't have to be, there are many people where this doesn't, many countries where this doesn't exist. But where it exists, he said, the law may be rhetoric, but it need not be empty rhetoric. Uh, there, was, there will always be some men who actively believe in their own procedures and in the logic of justice. Okay, so lawyers may be a powerful source of this cultural achievement. If they have this stuff in their head, they think this way, they value the values that are born along by legal traditions, this can be important. Okay, but as Stalin once said when he was told that the Pope didn't like what he was doing, he said, well, how many divisions has the Pope got? So you could say here, how many divisions have lawyers got? And this is an important key part of Thompson's argument. He says, when you look at the fights in the 18th century, it wasn't between these rulers who had the law and were just beating the, the peasants with it, they said, we've got rights here. We should be treated according to these existing rights of law. So it was part of actual agrarian country practice. It was, it was in their heads too. Not just on the books, maybe not on the books, but in the heads of the people, to some extent, in some ways. They felt aggrieved when what they took to be their legal rights were being abused. Now, when you have that, as I'm going to say in a second, it's a remarkable thing to have. Now, Thompson was enough of a uh, Marxist. He wasn't a lawyer. That should, I should emphasize that. I think that's why he was so inter interesting. But he was enough of a Marxist to... A lot of Marxists say, well, all right, law is not just a club that you beat other people out the head with. It is an ideology, and that's why it's sinister, because people believe that what's legal is good, and they don't, they're disarmed intellectually. They, you say, this is wrong or this is right, and then somebody tells you, but that's the law. And he says, even if it's true that law is an ideology, that doesn't mean that the people whose ideology it is 
can do what they like with it. They can't just do what they like with it because, partly for instrumental reasons, it only works as an ideology if people are convinced, so you've got to sometimes act in accordance with it. But secondly, some of these people come to believe their ideology. They may deeply... Now, all of these things are variable. That is, not every society has them in equal measure, as I will point out. But that's part of his argument. And the next part is something which... We're talking about something 40 years old. I've read those 12 pages. Like many people, it took me a long to, time to read the other 258. But I'd read those 12 pages many, many times, teaching classes, writing about it, and so on. And I only came on what I think is precious. It's in, it's in, a, in yellow, just to show how precious it is. Precious as gold. Uh, when I was writing this paper. But it's there all the time. He says, he's not just saying the actual restraint on power is what matters. What matters, he says, as well, and behind it, is that people have the notion, the idea, the belief that power is appropriately restrained. That's the right way for power to be. I don't think Putin... Would un maybe you can't say it in Russian, but he couldn't say it. Stalin certainly couldn't say it. Hitler couldn't say it. The notion is a key thing. A key thing. Uh, I'll give some examples in a second. So, when we see the despised Whigs, that is, the ruling class, in, uh, manipulating the law, we feel contempt for men whose practice belied the resounding rhetoric of the age. But we feel contempt, not because we're contemptuous of the notion of a just and equitable law, but because this notion has been betrayed. It gives us a language not just of endorsement, but of criticism. A language and grounds for criticising the arbitrary exercise of power. That's what he says. What does it mean to say that the notion is of a cultural achievement of universal significance? I want to say that, that, I mean, that's a big claim. Do you mean that everyone everywhere has it? No, of course. It's not universally existent. It is of universal significance. I want to say that, I want to interpret him to be saying, that the notion and the reality of power which is reliably tempered so it's not arbitrary is universe will be helpful to everyone everywhere in the world. That's something that is a value which I don't see a counter value. That doesn't mean that it should always win. I think lying is never good, but sometimes we have to lie. Even for good reason we have to lie. But we've done something bad, even if we had to do it, even if we think it was good to do it. Similarly, the claim is the tempering of power, so it not be arbitrary, is of universal significance. But in saying that, I want to just uh, put one amendment and then explain at last why the term tempering seems to me so fit for this purpose. When Thompson writes, and in some of the quotations you have seen, he talks about the reduction of, anti, uh, of arbitrary power in the way that almost everyone does when they talk about the rule of law, as a kind of negative thing. We've got to block, limit, curb power. To reduce arbitrary power means to limit it, to put shackles on it. That's the, term, that's the language he uses. It's the language virtually everybody uses. Now, a couple of people only have said, but hang on. Uh, to temper power weakens, that is, limits power holder's ability to do bad things, but it actually might strengthen their ability to do good things. I don't know how many swimmers there are. It looks cold out there, but I'm a fanatical swimmer. Not a good one, but a fanatical one. And for a long time, I've been trying to perfect my stroke. Now, what does that mean? It means that this is not going to do it for me. I've got to learn disciplined ways which make it impossible for me now as a swimmer to do what I used to do. I can't do that anymore. It's going to be stylish. It's going to be graceful. 
But it also, well, you haven't seen it, you don't know. Uh, but it also enables me to be like a fish in the water. Well, not quite like a fish, more like a whale in my case. But the point there is that it's key to capture the importance of, or the character of, of a proper understanding of tempering power. Judges get jurisdiction that gives them power. Lots of institutions are given power for good, non-arbitrary purposes. We need that. Power, Friedrich Hayek once said, power is the arch enemy of liberals. Well, that's nonsense. Power can't be the arch enemy. Otherwise, the Ukrainians would have nothing to go against. Of course, arbitrary power is, but they need power at the moment. And power, we need power for all sorts of good purposes. We need it, though, not to be arbitrary. So when I was thinking, because I was using the conventional language for a long time, I was thinking, how do I get out of that? Because uh, I want to capture this insight. And I thought, oh, tempering. And I felt proud for about a day until I realized or discovered that Cicero thought so too, and he was older than me. And before Cicero, the Greeks used a term called sophrosyne, which was a, what the Greek great but flawed heroes in Greek uh, myths lacked. They were huge and courageous and strong, but they had a hubris. They had no restraint. They had no self-reflection. They had no thoughtfulness. So Frosinone was the faculty the ca of character which encompassed those things. And Cicero in Rome, ancient Rome, took over the word, translated it as temperantia. And temperantia was the character of it was Sophrosyne. And so it meant, it became in Catholic theology one of the cardinal virtues. It's a virtue of restraint, of moderation, of reflection, but not necessarily of weakening. And that's why uh, it appeals to me as a term because at least in English, the same word is used for what you do when you put iron together with various other allies and you make steel. It is tempered steel, much stronger than the elements from which it was formed. If you temper glass, I presume some of this glass is break proof, it has to be, the term in English and in many languages is the same, tempered. And then I was being, I was being interviewed by a Polish journalist. I speak Polish, but Adam only half admits it, and I speak with uh, many mistakes and a lot of gaps. And so the journalists were saying, well, what's wrong with Polish politics? And I said, well, where do I begin? But one thing is that you don't think or don't even reg have regard for the tempering of power by institutions. And he said, oh, tempering. You mean that the power has to be sharpened like a quill pen so it doesn't mess and leave blots on the page. I didn't know what he was talking about. I said, yes! But what he was talking about, which I later discovered, is that in Polish, and actually in English you have some of this, a temperówka is a pencil sharpener. So to temper in this sense means to sharpen your instrument. Right, so, tempering is restraint. Tempering is in institutions, balance, separation, etc. Montesquieu uses the term tempering. He also uses the term moderation, not identically. But he says you need this balance of features and institutions to temper power. But also, and this is a, uh, a strand which comes through absolutist theorists from Baudin to Thomas Hobbes and others, the state's got to be able to do what a state's got to be able to do. And that becomes a liberal insight of importance. And so that's what I... Uh, that's what I think is, is, is necessary. Which brings me to my last section, uh, which is return to Europe. I started, well, I started with Thompson, but really I started by focusing on some populist leaders. I quoted Orban, I quoted Kaczynski. Now, what does this... And, and, and they are in, uh, not life and death, but very strong struggle between them and many Europeans who say that the rule of law is a fundamental European value. And so if you've agreed to be part of Europe, as you have and they have, it meant signing on to the rule of law. 
what do we say to this notion that the rule of law is a universal value? Well, you know what I say. I say, sorry, is a European value. I say they're right, but they're too modest. It's not just a European value. It's a universal value for the reasons and in the sense that I've tried to outline. But, and this is a second qualification, it all depends what you mean by the rule of law. If you mean the conventional view that the rule of law is these institutions, those institutions, these rules, those, these forms of rules, those, then that's not a universal value. What is a universal value is the cultural achievement of which I've spoken, the notion and the reality of, and, and ways of doing it, that temper reliably, temper power. That's not just words, that's an enormously precious achievement. Distinguishes civilizations from other civilizations and societies from other civil societies. I'll give you a couple of examples. For example, uh, Mayan Adams, his adopted and my born society, Australia, was founded by a bunch of English boats and marines bringing convicts from English jails to Australia when, after the American uh, War of Independence, they couldn't take them anymore to America, which was no longer a colony. So the, co the convicts came to Australia among whites, the lowest of the low, in 1788. By 1840, these lowest of the low had independent government. Many of them had their own properties. They served on juries. They fought for this, fought for it, not physically, by legal argument. And they did it because they had a weak... The, I mean, the captain, the, the head of the Marines was months away from England. He had his Marines. He could do what he liked. But in his head, he couldn't do what he liked. They, who knew a lot about the law, having all been convicted of crimes, said, you and we share this, this belief that the law has to restrain power. And that worked for them. It didn't have to be like this. I often have a fantasy. What if, instead of English convicts coming to Australia, Russian convicts had come to Australia? Well, they come from a different tradition of exercise of power, of a notion of unrestrained power, or at least power unrestrained by law. It's not part of legal tradition. In some countries, it's not part of Chinese legal tradition either. And it wasn't like this in Australia for Aborigines. We have on uh, Saturday a referendum which tries to, again, do something to compensate for what I claim, I believe, is the, the, the absolutely terrible treatment of Aborigines since whites came to the country. The difference was not the institutions of law, though they were the same institutions. It was the culture, the sense of a mixed common culture between us whites and Aborigines. It wasn't there. The cultural basis of this universal achievement was non-existent, and the tragedy of that for Aborigines is almost unsurpassed. So to conclude, what's going on in the European debate? Orban might say, Professor Krieger, I agree with you completely, that uh, legal institutions, he has said something, but he didn't say it to me, uh, institutions change, countries have their own traditions, none of this uh, can be just sent over the, over the uh, waves to other countries. You've got to work up your own indigenous traditions. Now, if he's talking about institutions, about rules, about imposition of rules, then I think there is an overlap between what I say and what he says. But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about this cultural significance. And what different, as I mentioned, different societies, different civilizations have different histories. Sometimes you're just lucky to be born in a country which has, for a whole range of reasons, which really have to do with virtue, but balance of interests and powers, which has gelled a situation where powers balance powers, where people have to act with restraint when they exercise of power. And in that sense, it is a cultural tradition. But that's not the only way you can do it. Uh, 
Adam mentioned uh, my intellectual mentor about whom I wrote a book, Philip Selznick, a great uh, sociologist who began as a sociologist of institutions and organizations and then moved to be a uh, sociologist of law. In his earlier writing, he talked a lot about leadership in administration. And he said, basically, I'm using my words, that we think of organizations just as many people talk about the rule of law. What's the institution? What's the rule? What's etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. He says, but many organizations get institutionalized. That is, they become enmeshed in values beyond what's needed to perform any particular task. If you think of the church as against the post office, church is much more institutionalized in this sense. People think of it with value. The army as well. Many things are highly institutionalized. Sometimes, typically, that's a very long process, goes over long periods of history. But it's not the only way you can do it. Apart from institutionalization as a process, there's institutionalization as a project. That is, this usually comes from the top. You want to change certain attitudes, certain cultural achievements. But you can't do it just by decreeing, by passing a new law, because it doesn't change the facts on the ground and the thoughts on the ground. You have to be much more subtle. You have to take an account of what is already institutionalized. You have to generate, not just build. We talk in rule of law programs about building the rule of law. No one built the rule of law. It's something like grafting a plant onto, it's an agricultural process. It takes time. Things, people's thoughts have to be changed. Now, in the process of European integration since 2004, most of the Western efforts have been very clueless about this. After the collapse of communism, the whole expansion at the end of history, uh, it seemed obvious that this Western way to go was the way to go. So you roll this stuff out. You give people laws, you have constitutional courts everywhere, it's a go for it. Now that was bound to fail because institutionalization was not considered. Now, paradoxically, the people that I have been arguing against, Orban, Kaczynski, Modi, uh, Chavez in, in, and others, they know this. They are actually brilliant institutionalizers, but they are deinstitutionalizing institutionalizers. That is, they know that these institutions are not firmly rooted in a lot of soil. And they pretend to copy the forms while undermining the attachment to the forms and the meaning of those forms. And so, to come back to the claim that I attributed to Orban, which actually he made, that the rule of law is something to be done differently in different cultures, it's true about the bits and pieces, the institutions, the rules and the laws. But it's not true about what Thompson called the cultural achievement of universal significance. That is the notion and the realization that the tempering of power so that it not be arbitrary is an achievement of fundamental importance. One last thing, which should have gone earlier, but I forgot at that time and I've just woken up now. Why do I think arbitrary power is so important? It, uh, tempering arbitrary power. What's wrong with arbitrary power? Some people think, we're the guys. That's what Kaczynski thinks. We're the guys who know what to do. We don't need these other people getting in the way, these stupid elite judges and other people. We are the voice of the people, too. Or, if you're just a leader, you, you just say, oh, it's my voice. But we're the voice of the people. What, who should get in the way of the people? The reason I think that arbitrary power is a universal bad has to do with First of all, what is it? That's also something that people run away from. That is, we don't have very good definitions. Let me just give you four examples, four different sorts of exercises of power, which I think we would normally call arbitrary, and which I think, to use an Australian expression, stink. One is uncontrolled power. If somebody with power can do what they like, we're in trouble. They may not be in trouble, but we're in trouble. Secondly, unpredictable. If they can do what 
whatever they do. We don't know when it's coming, where it's coming, where it's going, etc. It's shocking. We just keep our head down. We're scared. We've got reason to be scared. Thirdly, unrespectful. If they make a decision, if I make a decision and put you in jail because I have evidence which has been tested and I'm concluded that you've done something wrong, that's one thing. But if I just throw you in jail or if I put a road through your house in the road that goes to the palace in Bucharest that was built by the uh, socialism in one family of, uh, of Ceausescu, in one, I think in 24 hours, they demolished I don't know how many houses. It didn't matter. They would just happen to be in the way. So that's unrespectful. And the third, fourth is uh, without any reasonable proportion between the measure and the, the purpose that you have in mind. I want to do X. I hit you over the head with it. If there's no relationship between hitting you over the head, I just do it. So these are four, I think, objectionable ways of exercising power. They're all, I think, appropriately called arbitrary. Now, I won't go on at length because I've already spoken too long. Uh, why? What's wrong with that? Briefly, and there's a, there are chapters about all of this. First of all, when power is available, serious power is available in the society in any of those ways, it breeds fear. Judith Schlar, uh, who I mentioned from Riga, is very famous for talking about the liberalism of fear. That fear is such a terrible thing to be put in endless or perpetual. Or, uh, fear is such a terrible thing. We should do a great amount to make, that, make the sources of fear contained. Fear, liberty, obviously is constrained by this. Domination is furthered by it. You don't have to actually be hitting somebody over the head. For example, the republican tradition in political thought emphasizes that even if a slave owner is not abusing his slave or a husband who has all power over a wife is not at that moment exercising it or is a nice guy, doesn't exercise it, the fact that he can is a pernicious state of affairs. Coordination, that is, if I don't know you, I don't know anything about you, I know how to treat Adam because I know him backwards, he knows me backwards, we know what to expect, but other people we don't know what to expect. So coordination between us is very difficult unless the exercise of power is predictable, is con constrained in some way. And finally, rulers who have arbitrary power often think they need it to do clever things. Very often, it enables them, encourages them to do very stupid things. Some of the worst things that are done by people with power are done because they have a lot of power. So for all of those reasons, I think arbitrary power is objectionable. For all of those reasons, I think we should keep in mind that it is not a matter of forms, but it is a matter of the conception of how power should be exercised and ways in the world of tempering it which are going to differ between society and society. In that respect, uh, Orban is right. What is wrong in the protests of modern populists is to claim that they are serving the rule of law because they're pretending to use the institutions so long as their intention is to, re to break the sources of limitation, but also of genuine tempering of power, they're doing a very bad thing. And I hope that E.P. Thompson would agree with me. I even hope that you'd agree with me. Thank you very much. Thanks, Martin. Uh, now I open the floor to the question comments. As you know, there was a true humanistic interpretation of the concept of rule of law, it seems to me. And uh, sort of the meta-interpretation, because what is in the background is all those huge knowledge about the operation of the legal institutions and rules and norms. So who wants to start to kick the ball? Um, Martin? Let's go back to protecting those strokes. To? Strokes. Strokes. Uh, 
in order to develop a really good swimming technique, you need a trainer, right? Who will tell you not to hold your hand like this, but you know, like this, and then move in a certain way, and then we'll definitely watch you do it, right? But eventually, muscle power, muscle memory takes over, and you're a good swimmer. The same goes for tempering or sharpening. You need somebody who is know, who knows what they're doing, and then tempering or sharpening glass, metal, or anything. So, do you think um, the power to temper the, the ability to temper a power can come within the system, or should it be done from somebody outside who knows what they're doing? Uh, it depends on the system, and it does, I think, because. What I think people have talked too little about is what can we imagine? What can we imagine? Uh, I once was struck by a, a, a contrast um, that occurred in roughly the same time, in the late 70s, between two ways of dealing with uh, disappointment, two, two political ways of dealing with disappointment. In Australia, we had a very ambitious and strong and big, I mean, impressive looking man, six foot three or, whatever, or more. For me, over six foot is already very high. Uh, anyway, big and very ambitious uh, Prime Minister, who for a couple of reasons uh, was dismissed by the Governor General, by the Queen's representative. It was a very uh, controversial moment and very controversial, was considered uh, one of the great uh, controversies in Australian political history, and I'm just remembering. Uh, I was asked by a friend, a Hungarian philosopher, who was in exile, came into exile in Australia from Hungary about 10 years later, very great philosopher, and Julian Marquis. And he said, Martin, tell me what uh, this was about. And I patiently explained to him there was this legal issue about the power of the Senate. There was another issue about this. The, and the, the, there were these interpretations. Those, Martin, I find this ununderstandable. What's ununderstandable? That it was all talked about law. Now, the fact is that in Australia, no one thought to talk any other way. No one thought about bringing out the troops. So this guy when he was dismissed, stood in front of Parliament House and with this bellowing voice that he said, only one person will recognise it, uh, what did he say? Oh, before he spoke, the assistant to the Governor-General finished the declaration that this guy was to be dismissed and said, God save the Queen. And this guy says, well may you say, God save the Queen because nothing will save the Governor-General. Maintain the rage and the enthusiasm. Now, these are big words. Then he was dismissed, he, fought, uh, he contested an election, he was beaten, and he went off to a cushy job. So there was no trainer in the system. The system was the trainer. Now, when I talk about the process, often that is the difference. He didn't, it was not that he was not ambitious, and it may not be that he was not good. He just couldn't imagine in the system that he had inherited. Another thing, in, uh, in Hungary, in Poland, and in Israel, just before uh, this last catastrophe, uh, a similar process was going on. Israel came later, which was trying to reduce or decapitate the power of particularly initially the constitutional courts, apex courts, and other courts. It's happened in both those places. Critics alleged, I think with absolute justification, that these were attempts to, uh, to not necessarily destroy, but to make, to instrumentalize the power of the judiciary. Why? Because instead of the judges appointing judges, the political power. On our Australia, sorry, I don't want to boast about Australia, it just happened to be these examples. Section 72 of our Constitution tells you how the High Court, our top court, is appointed. It's by the government. But we had the dullest High Court in the world. There's nothing, there's, there, compared to so many other courts, there is just nothing much going on of a public 
value, symbolic value sort. Other things are going on. So I think if the system has this in it, you've got a great asset. But cultures change, some, and, and not everybody has that history. And then what I've called institutionalization as project requires, in your terms, that's why the top is so important. And that's why I think we've had double uh, disappointments in the last 30 years in Europe. One is that, if I can say we, people of the West who were committed to a transformation, I was certainly among them, didn't know what we were doing. We thought it was enough just to roll out the procedures and to roll out the technical stuff and to get people to have courts of this sort. We didn't, it was so obvious, there was nothing else there. But the top mattered in response. Orban first, Kaczynski after him and others. They know, I, I fear they've read Selznick. They know all about institutionalization and they employ it. They boost the institutionalized significance of traditions which are hostile to these measures. And they parody or, or uh, subvert abuse the, inst the institutions which are supposed to temper their power. So it's a long answer to an important question, but that's roughly it. Anybody else? Questions, comments? Yeah, uh, thank you very much for, uh, for your inspiring lecture. I teach constitutional law here, so the students will have to memorize your speech. <laughs> Uh, I, I wish I could have memorized it better. Yeah. <laughs> I have a question about the word that you have in yellow, uh, the, no, the, the notion of rule yeah. of law. It seems that you are aiming towards sort of subjective perception of what rule of law is. So it depends on who, who is talking about rule of law. We're talking about notion of rule of law, not a checklist. And how do you determine who this someone is? Why are you right and not Kaczynski? Oh, there are many answers to that last question. But uh, it's not, if it's subjective, it's difficult because there, this is just you. But it's intersubjective. Where it's strong, it is intersubjective. My story about the elections, it wasn't that he had this idea. Uh, he probably had it less than anyone because he wanted power. But he knew that this... This is in the air. Now, in some air, it's not. And, 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 but what I'm saying is, it's not the notion in the sense of a definition. It is the notion that it is appropriate in relation to power, appropriate, that it be tempered. Whereas in a lot of civilizations, and I don't mean this, I mean, it's just traditions are different in some traditions, important political legal traditions, it's never been thought that the... Uh, there's a book came out which impressed me. I haven't read it for a long time, so I hope I can get it right, by a guy called Hilton Root. I can't remember the title of the book, but the, the distinction... The, the, uh, it's, he, the question he asks is, why is it, or why was it, that um, the English kings, after the one time, extraordinary time in the 17th century, but by the, by after that, went to bed and slept, whereas the French king, much more powerful, was uh, with Louis XVI, had a different end. So the question is between a powerful and not powerful. The answer he gives has to do with a whole range of Things done for other purposes in English history, which meant that parliaments were important, that certain intermediate groupings were important. Not with this intention, but with this effect. And uh, often the tempering of power, if you're lucky, is not an intentional thing. The British aren't especially clever, but they happen to have inherited that and not other things. Uh, and so that's why I distinguish process and project. Uh, in many civilizations, and civilization is perhaps too big a word, in the post-Soviet world, even if we said this came out of nowhere, it was just a Bolshevik in, 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 um, invention. 
But the post-Soviet world, if you think of also China and Vietnam and, and North Korea and so on, it's a big world. The notion that central power should be tempered was actively combated, was not admitted even in constitutional discourse, so the superiority of the party and so on, was just not part of the game that people played, the language or the, the sense of what is plausible, probable and possible in political relations didn't have it. And so if you come, as happened in the first accession, to ten countries who've come out of these systems, it was not enough, that's my claim, to say, well, here are the goods. Just run with it. Uh, but no one did much else. And I think that is the genius of the populist response. They're not saying, they're bad institutions, we've got better institutions. They're undermining the whole game. That's an evil genius, I think, but clever. Other questions, comments? <sighs> Maybe I will grant the voice to myself. Okay? As Marcy mentioned, we disagree on plenty of stuff. Everything. <laughs> everything. <laughs> Almost everything. Uh, but uh, let's go to the issue. I agree with you. That is a, let's say, <coughs> humanistic achievement of the universal significance, the notion of rule of law. But there is a question how to install the rule of law. Well, you said through institutionalization. And then reading Selznick is with However, the enactment must build upon pre-existing resources. That seems to me is a crucial as, as such. Let me tell you a story. This is a story called the Budapest story. It's on the beginning of transformation, Budapest, uh, Joseph Rass arrived. And one of the listeners, Joseph Rass delivered talk about rule of law, like Martin today. And it's now uh, year 1991. And one of the Hungarian you know, students <coughs> stand up and ask, Professor Rass, Professor Russell was from Oxford, right? A don there. When we'll have a rule of law? Professor Russ, there was silence. And then he said, wait 1,000 years and you will get it. But now, if there is a cult cultural achievement, right? And you mentioned here Orban and Kaczynski, but they are leaders only. It means they express something. They were voted in. By whom? By the citizens. Which means possibly they are no pre-existing resources to the specific type of uh, institutionalization. Could you please make a comment on that? Well, if so, uh, it's very sad. Um, but I don't think it's true that there are no resources. There are resources. You know as many, you know the same people in Poland as I know. There are a lot of people who have these commitments. Poland is not one thing. Hungary is not one thing. There are many things with different beliefs, different constituency, different interests. What I think was lacking in the in 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 conceptually lack. I don't know that we could have done. It. I mean, Raz's answer is is glib, clever, and stupid. Uh, yeah, if you've got a thousand years of good stuff, that's great. Okay, uh, but Japan did not have a particularly constrained polity until it lost the Second World War. Uh, Germany certainly didn't have a constrained polity. The German Reichstag post-Second World War is very different from the German Reichstag pre... Things can change. Uh, and they can change and they can... I'm hoping, and I think that should be the effort and the ambition of people who have particular values, but you've got to think about it, and that's the mistake, I think. So I, I, I fear we are coming to some sort of agreement. It's not going to be easy to last the day, but... Um, Wait till midnight. Yeah. Uh, that is, the agreement is at this level. That, yes, I... Adam was saying this, I think, before I was saying it, that a lot of this Western stuff that is put in in uh, post-communist accession countries doesn't connect to important, existing, deeply held values in the society. And I think that's plausible. So a lot more should have been done with that. And I think local politicians, many of them are much more aware than bureaucrats of it and are trying in this present election, which 
will be uh, on, on, on Sunday. We'll see what success they have, but the job will still be ahead of them. Uh, I, I think we do have enough. I mentioned Germany and, and Japan. Well, they're not small uh, examples. Quite a few countries in Latin America also aren't bad examples, but quite a few are. I, we have no recipe for it. We have easy res recipes for items in a constitution, for how to staff a court. We don't have recipes. These are some of the fundamental problems. And one of the things that I'm amazed by in the last couple of years is how much what is old is new again. I was born after the Second World War. My parents, who actually came from, from Poland, uh, experienced a history of catastrophe, as I'm sure many of your ancestors did, uh, which, particularly living in sunny Australia, born after the Second World War, seemed to me gone. That was the past. But somehow we'd fixed that problem. Well, what we see in uh, Ukraine now and in, in Israel is these problems don't go away. And we don't, aren't good at fixing. So we've got to think about how to do it better. And I think uh, we, if we could just change Orban's values, he might give us some clues. But unfortunately, he's not well disposed to do that. But no, I, I, you know, I think... Razz's is a kind of smart-ass response. It's not good enough to people who are uh, struggling, many of them, for very... It's not as though in Poland nobody knows about tempering power or in Russia or in other places. These are hard things to generate if the ground is not fertile. Uh, but the ground not being fertile is a very good reason to try to generate them. Thanks. Another question, colleagues? Want to say something? Okay. Uh, Hans Oster, I'm a teacher here in school. Um, looking at Poland and Hungary, um, it's not that much, my feeling is, about uh, removing a uh, restraint on power, but is, this is linked to the, the perception of what the, the court of laws are, and they say that these laws are not just, or traditions are more just, and therefore we have rights follow our direction and we don't and concern about the uh, constitutional courts which are something uh, imposed upon us by West as, as a condition for accession to the European Union for example but our tradition our conviction is more just than the law and therefore we go this way isn't it? well uh, they may occasionally be more just but what I'm specifically talking about at least in this talk is not the substantive justice of the law, but the difference between trying to move the institutions to allow those in power to do what they like, which they will call just, and maybe they believe to be just, some do, some don't, uh, and a situation where that ability is uh, tempered, in the only ways we know, well, what are they? Well, partly it's the cultural notion, partly it's just in the heads, but partly we've learned from Montesquieu, spread it around a bit. So uh, don't put all the power in the same hands. We know that that's pretty simple, it's pretty general. Uh, and one of the things in the Polish debate, which is interesting, people who say that sort of thing, the sort of thing I've been saying, again and again use the specific phrase, trui that is, the tripartite, tripartite separation of powers. And from my point of view, that's not the issue. It could be seven partite. It could be 20. What you want is that not, not one... They say tripartite because it's somebody's taught them that Montesquieu thought that that's what they had in Britain and he found they didn't have it, but it was too late. The Americans knew that Montesquieu was clever, so they took the three... The three, there's a certain logic to it, uh, but the imp there are a whole range of conditions. Culture is not enough. I just emphasize it because no one emphasizes it. But a strong civil society. So if, if Orban tries to uh, 
lay or put in label anybody who gets funds from overseas as uh, agents or um, an independent media which hardly exists at all in Hungary and in Poland exists outside whatever the government has managed to cannibalize. So I haven't actually talked about the justice of the law, about the substantive justice of the law. That's a question. That's a real question. And it would move from, and there's no, there's no uh, reason to believe that just because it's law, it's just. We know that. Uh, I'm talking about tempering power. And I, I, I know some arguments, but they seem to me spurious, for saying it's better if, if these guys can do what they like. We, we have, this is the people's will. That's very often what populist leaders say, that, and it's a different thing. In democracy, everybody says, I mean, Democrats want to be popular. That's the job. Uh, but populists like Chavez in Venezuela or Orban, I use those two examples, there are others, claim something more. They claim to embody the people's will. And so Chavez actually said, when you're voting for me, when you vote for me, you are voting for yourselves because I am the people of... And uh, when Orban lost in the election, whenever it was, 245 or 22, anyway, the, but he said, <laughs> it really, he did say it. I might get the words wrong, but he, he said this. Uh, we can't be in opposition because the homeland cannot be in opposition. So if you have that claim to make, then part of its implication is, get out of my way. Uh, who are you? Not you. <laughs> who is anybody who claims a judge or a, a media or, the, or a civil servant to be independent? Who wants you to be independent? It's my will. You've got to carry it out. For some reason, still unexplained, an extraordinary thing happened in Poland earlier this week. We haven't talked about it. The two top generals in the Polish... Uh, military resigned five days before the election. What's that about? I don't know exactly. But clearly it's about a chain of command. They felt that they are simply being instrumentalized, or maybe worse than that or more than that, I don't know. Uh, so there are a whole range of things which can be imitated. They can be imitated, which actually tangibly reduce concentration of power. And that's a big deal. Thank you. I look forward to art. That's, in my opinion, one of the best books on on, uh, on uh, populism. The title of this book, written by Nadia Urbinati, is "I the People," right? Which we the people? No, I the people. I the people. I not we. We is in the no, American no, no, Constitution. No. I, I the people. people. Precisely uh, uh, giving this. Uh, I'm older than him, so I just your, thought of it. Claim about you know <coughs> Chavez and. and it's not that bad. Anybody wants to ask the question? Last chance. I see the you see the audience showing the temper on their critical power oh, in are. relation to you. I'm it's scared a good of sign. It means a resource for the institutionalization. <laughs> Any question? Comments? If not, so we arrive at the time. Thanks very much, Martin. <laughs> Thank you for your patience and forbearance and, and it was good to meet you.